And the, the interesting thing about that is going ahead maybe 100 years and looking back onto our time, what would we say about it? And I think that's a very good exercise or a practice for people to do, uh, for any of the listeners to do, is to really look at our time and look at the underlying message that's being portrayed. And if you look at the entertainment industry, whether that's going to you know somehow still exist a hundred years from now, if you look back in our generation right now, what do you see the most of in advertising? What do you see the biggest appeal of in movies and in uh, music all over the radio? What are the the impulses that you see the most on there that that attract people? And it really comes down to sex, uh, violence, um, degeneration in many ways. In many yeah. ways, uh, now nowadays it's not uh, hip or fashionable to be in to be extremely uh, not just intelligent but emotionally uh, intact. It's not very hip to be. Um, conservative and religious. It's not very hip to be a, a very genuine stand-up uh, person anymore. Uh, and I, I'm at least talking about my generation. If you look at a lot of the music and if you uh, look at a lot of the movies, the people that we relate to the most, the music that we want to hear, the, the characters that we want to see in our movies are those badasses, the ones that can get away with saying anything, like uh, House on TV. The reason why he seems to be such a popular character, if you look at it, he's indignant. He's completely indignant and uh, emotionless in many ways. And there's underlying currents of the emotion, and I like how they add it in that show. I'm not actually talking bad about that show. What I'm talking about is what people... Uh, what the viewer wants to see now. We want to hear um, uh, artists and musicians singing about going to the bars and getting wasted and starting fights and really yeah. the, these very primal things that having to do with violence, uh, competition, um, nothing but like money, the material things. And I mean, it's not very hard to see, but if you yeah. look at uh, TV even, um, if, you know, if a past- TV comes out, if a new show comes out, and it's not the storyline isn't basic soft porn with the text, the 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 um, the communication in the story being sexual in innu- innuendo, it doesn't make it through the first season. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's Guaranteed. the again, that's that's the core. Sex is definitely the core primal impulse that people look for in most of. Uh, most of any type of media whatsoever, whether it be a video game, whether it be a movie, whether it be music. And if you think about it, obviously, I just did a presentation in Puerto Rico where I showed several slides of all of the sexual references in children's movies, all of the sexual references in um, not just references, uh, hidden symbolism, like subliminal, yeah, Yeah. hidden images and and, uh, symbolism, um, and even uh, the words sex, um, shapes, uh, different, um, different things that, um, give a very phallic or, um, some, some very feminine, uh, uh, symbol to it in, in some way, shape or form. Um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of phallic imagery in, um, in alcohol or, or liquor ads oh, yeah. in, in Coca-Cola ads. But I mean, th- th- that's really limiting it too much because you see it everywhere. I mean, there, there is sexual symbolism hidden in absolutely everything. If you look at anything, even programs on the computer sometimes have this. And it, it becomes... Video games, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so pretty much everything you look at. But then again, you have to really ask the question then, why? Because if you look at the subconscious mind, the subconscious mind is, is um, a, a seven-year-old child, not even. Uh, it, it stays around that because it's very... It's very primal. So you, it looks very animalistic because whether that's the, the course of evolution coming from the animal kingdom into the human kingdom, and when you degenerate, you almost degenerate back into those primal animalistic drives. But what then, so you really have to ask what makes a human a human? What really differentiates a human from any other kingdom? And it, it's, it comes down to conscious will. It comes down to our will because it's not about neglecting those primal impulses or ignoring them. It's about acknowledging them but realizing that it doesn't serve us. So moving on to – and I'm not just saying more intellectual or sophisticated realms. I'm saying but just a a more um, 
a more subtle and compassionate and loving, deep-rooted connection with uh, all the flora and the fauna of the earth, our food, having relationships with our own community, learning how to communicate with people, knowing ethics, understanding love, understanding compassion, you know, as well as you could understand love, because obviously love... uh, Love isn't um, isn't just part of the human kingdom. It's a phenomena that has been alive long before uh, humanity and will exist long after humanity. But I mean, if you think about it, none of this is taught in the educational system. It, no. uh, like the educational system is supposedly there to help the individual. It's supposedly there to uh, not raise the child, but to help educate the child. But if you look at the term educate, to educate comes from uh, as a Latin uh, edu. Uh, I think it was educare or something, um, which basically it means to uh, educo or something along those lines, which means to adduce or to draw out of a child, which is completely different uh, from what you see in the educational system. In the educational system, we shove information into the minds of the children and we train them to on command, just like we would a dog throwing a treat. We train them on command to regurg- to organize all that information and then regurgitate it on command. And that, to me, sounds a lot more like a computer than it does a child or a, or a human entity. So basically, the educational system, in many ways, teaches us how to run the gears of society. It does not teach us how to be an individual. It doesn't even give us the opportunity to be an individual. It limits us through job placement and saying these aptitude tests that say, okay, well, you're good at this, this, and this. That means this is the best career for you. You know, guidance counselors will send you off into the world thinking that that's all these children can do with with their level of aptitude, which really just has to do with running the gears of society, grinding those gears. And it has, in no educational system around the world have I seen, um, at least in, in Western educational systems, have I seen any mention of ethics, like real yeah. ethics. Even even in an ethics class, it's more formulaic. It really has nothing to do with uh, it's, Yeah, read, read Aristotle ethics and tell me what you think of it. Um, a lot of what the school system is, is memorize and regurgitate. Just memorize and regurgitate. You want to get in trouble? Ask why. Mm-hmm. If they yeah, come up with a with a question and they're asking you the question before you give them the answer, you say, "Why would that be? Why is that? Why?" Exactly. And why, it's, it's, why that question? Why not? Why not angle it this way? Well, no, that's not how. What? Just just answer the darn question the way we're supposed to. Right. We're not taught how. We're not taught how to think. We're taught what to think. And in many ways, um, it's completely antithetical to the human organism because if you think about it, children immediately know instantaneously from birth they know how to learn they learn through their environment they learn through observation which is the true form of learning but when information is uh pretty much useless information is shoved into the child's uh the child's mind and the child's memory it's not even really about the that specific information it really isn't it's about entraining the mind to be able to take in information and regurgitate it basically it's implanting a psychological form of software just like you would put software onto a computer all it is is entraining the mind to be able to perform a specific task that uh, later on, when they get out of uh, high school and they get out of college, then they can be placed into a, a different mechanism within the entire machine of the system that we call society today. And within that mechanism, they're told what to do, they comprehend it, and they just grind those gears. Basically, it's, a, it's a, the whole system, this societal system, is a machine, and we're taught how to be the, the little pieces of that machine. And it, and that's by our own design in many ways. I, I agree. I agree. It's like a mass-produced profile. They just install it, and it's it's like uh, you know all the machines are the same. It's like everybody's you know running with a Mac, you know. And, Absolutely. Uh, and I don't really know how to extend that into like third world countries and how it applies to them. And I know there's being a lot of withheld. Um, from those sorts of societies and, Absolutely. and you know stuff like that uh, we're going to have to go for a quick break um, and uh, we're going to do that right now okay and we're back okay so Ben uh, do you um, do you feel that the points that you were trying to put across were well received um, for w- which points I'm sorry 
like on on both films, the, like your conclusions, your your mm-hmm. your ideas. Yes, uh, I absolutely believe that. In I would say, for the majority, they were very well received. Um, I received specifically three types of um, emails after that, and this is, I mean, uh, this still goes on today. There are, there's, and this is just really going off of the the feel that I get from the, um, from the intentions of the ones sending the emails. Um, I get a lot of people that say they absolutely love everything in the films and you know they'd like to start a dialogue or you know you know they just want to say thank you or they want to contribute in some way shape or form because they absolutely love it obviously there are the others that um they don't and they really don't like the um uh the, the information and more of like the details in there i've never really had anyone um challenge me on um on the on the intention of it, uh, you know, I've never really had anybody really challenge me on the obviously saying that self governance and self sovereignty, sovereignty of the mind. I've never had anyone say that that sounds like a bad idea. Obviously, um, and then I have others who are, are more just give more constructive criticism, which is great because criticism is what helps me. Specifically, if you know, if if I'm going to be a public figure at all, which you know, I never intended to do it in this way. Um, I, you know, in the in the music industry, that's that's a different thing. I always intended to have somewhat of a voice that way, but I never intended for anything like this to happen. I'm very grateful for the opportunity, though. So I figure that if I'm going to be any form, you know, whatsoever of a type of a public figure, then I really need to take into consideration what people say, even if they don't say it in, you know, in a very um, uh, pleasing or, or a calm or a very compassionate way, I still try to take into consideration what drove them to send hate mail or what drove them to say something like that. And typically it, it, it reflects more on them than it does me, so I don't take it personally, but... Um, when there's constructive criticism, I really actually prefer to have constructive criticism than for somebody to just say they loved everything about the film and they wouldn't change a thing and they're, you know, they're going to buy 100 DVDs and, uh, and hand them out to their friends. That's great. I absolutely uh, you know, I, I appreciate that and the support and everything like that. But I would prefer that if they do have anything to challenge in it, that they voice that because I – I'm not here just to give my opinion and I don't care what anybody else thinks. It's not that type of attitude. I really, the reason why I made the Hangman Project is because I want people's opinions. I want people's theories. I want people's philosophies. I want to know how people are taking the information. I want to know what other people are thinking. I want to know what I could do better. Right. So that that's that's really um, the way that it's received is those three ways. There's the people that absolutely love it. There's the people that absolutely hate it. And there's those that understand it and they give constructive criticism as to how I can make it better. But okay. but do you think do you think that we're, we're are, are we changing? Do you find there's enough people that are, that are starting to lean towards these areas? Um, I, I absolutely see that this is the number one biggest growing field, and it's really thanks to the Internet. Um, or, I mean, it, it wouldn't have to be the Internet, but any type of media that quickly transfers information that's absolutely free because there's, there's nothing to stop somebody that has the Internet from going online and just looking at information up on YouTube or on you know anything, on any type of uh, website whatsoever. There's nothing to stop people. 